Now you see, it's true, we mustn't give the show away. That's why there are esoteric teachings. But on the other hand, there is another opposite extreme, which is not realizing that the show is a show. And that's as bad as giving the show away. Say you go to the movies, and you go to see some great horror movie, you know, awful thing. Well, why does one do it? You want a thrill. And the whole of the universe wants a thrill. That's what it's all about. Otherwise, it would be boring. But when you go to the movie, you know in your heart of hearts that it's only a movie. And yet you contrive to some degree to forget this while you're there. And therefore get scared and uh, feel real creeps. But that's great. Some people like to go and cry. They go and see some tragedy and just love to weep because it's a catharsis. It uh, gets all the salt out of you or something. I don't know. So uh, you, 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 you do this thing. And uh, it is, we can say it's vicarious. Yeah. But that is the spirit of showmanship, of play. So one might say then that uh, it is possible in this life to attain a sort of metaphysical courage in which you know, really know, deep within, that the most harrowing experiences that physical existence can offer are a show. Now this is the, uh, what you might call, ultimate nerve. And, for example, when the samurai in Japan studied Zen, that's what they wanted to get from. They wanted to get ultimate nerve, so that absolutely nothing would faze them. So there is a poem which says, Under the sword lifted high, there is hell making you tremble. But go ahead, and there is the land of bliss. Don't hesitate. Don't be blocked. Don't be phased, nonplussed by the illusion. Now you would say, well, that's all very well. But I can't bring myself to that. I start to shake and I can't stop it. It's not to do with my will. And no amount of gritting my teeth, clenching my muscles, uh, exercising my willpower can get rid of the shakes when I am really scared. That's true. But you must remember that the secret to all this is not to be afraid of fear. When you can really allow yourself to be afraid and you don't resist the experience of fear, you are truly beginning to master fear. But when you refuse to be afraid, you are resisting fear. And that simply sets up a vicious circle of being afraid of fear and being afraid of being afraid of fear and so on. And that's what we call worry. Worry is simply a chronic condition. And people who worry are going to worry no matter what happens. Because when one possible threat is exterminated, they will immediately discover another because worry is an infinitely skinned onion and you can go on and on and on because the moment you see you reduce the size of the onion and you get your worry down to about this suddenly your whole sense of distance and size changes and because you're looking so intently at this little onion it fills your whole field of vision and is once again a big onion see you start peeling that down but as you get another little one about this size then it enlarges itself in your judgment and your sense of values. And once more, it's colossal. Now that's always going on. So if you are disposed to worry, there is always plenty to worry about. You make plenty of money and you have no troubles about that, then you start wondering if you're going to get a disease. And the doctor says, no, it's all right, you, you, nothing wrong with you. Then you wonder if you're going to get into an accident. And then you take precautions, and then you wonder if there's going to be a political revolution, whether your house is going to be robbed. There's always something. 
So it is a, really, this kind of worrying is a completely useless pursuit. And yet, we feel a little guilty if we don't do it. Because uh, it's somehow put into us that a proper amount of worrying is uh, showing a good sense of responsibility. You're concerned. And all people, you might say, who are socially conscious are concerned. So when we say, I'm concerned, it means <coughs> I have a frown on my face. And uh, I, I'm, I'm worried about you, about the nation, about the war, and so on. Concern. And Tillich said, religion is ultimate concern. I am concerned about the universe. But what I call concern, in the, the way I would want to interpret it, instead of this sort of frown, is something more like amazement. In other words, that existence is extremely peculiar. I can't get my, I can't explain this feeling because I don't know quite how to ask a question about existence so that I could be said to be wondering about it in some sort of clear thinking way. What, what, uh, it's a very nice thing to consider to yourself that if you were going to have an interview with the Lord God and you would have only five minutes and you might ask one question, what would you ask? And you've got plenty of time to think this over in advance. And you realize, question after question, say, no, that's not really the thing I want to get at. Uh-uh, it's not that. Like, do you exist? God would say, well, of course. Yes, here I am. <laughs> am I having a hallucination? <laughs> no. Well, uh, I'm, how can I be sure that this isn't a hallucination, you see? And then you reject all that sort of question. And when you finally come down to it, you don't know what to ask. There is a sort of question in your mind, not so much a question as a questioning. A feeling of, it's all unbelievable. It's amazing. I wonder at it. I marvel at it. It is a miracle that there is anything. But that feeling, you see, of the, the marvelousness of being is what I call, or would want to mean by Tillich's phrase, ultimate concern. It's also love is involved in it. See, that's the part of the problem of um, an abstractionist culture such as ours. As I indicated, we are not materialists, we are abstractionists. A materialist is a, is a lover, and therefore is somebody related to the present. Because, you see, you, you can't love except in the present. So, if then you try to obliterate fear, the fear that black may win. You're working in the wrong way. To attack a fear is to strengthen it. Because immediately you feel guilty if you don't succeed. Or you feel inadequate. But fear is something that arises naturally and spontaneously under certain circumstances just as you will feel warm if you get near a fire. And uh, you can't go up to a fire without some sort of self-hypnosis and then say, well, I refuse to be warm. There's something a bit weird about that. On the contrary, it is very natural to be afraid. And so if you don't try to knock it down, you don't try to make yourself over into some sort of preconceived idea of what you ought to be. Then you're on the track. <laughs>